But what I'll be presenting on today is actually something that I'm working on this year here and that is intended to be my next book project but is still very much in its formative stages. Um, the larger project, which I'll just give you a brief overview about, has to do with the convergence of old and new media and <clears throat> its specific implications for thinking about and representing alternative sexualities as well as telephilia and cinephilia. And that's in contradiction to the kind of common wisdom that the digital revolution is causing the death of cinema and the end of television, respectively, right? Um, so some of the things that I've been doing um, under this rubric, first I presented back in the fall a project in which I'm looking at 21st century women directors who make films independently and also distribute and exhibit them independently and are also interested for, in foregrounding narratively questions of alternative sexualities and relationships. So that's one aspect or case study of my larger project. Um, others have to do with specific communities of either queer media archivists and or queer media cinephile, telephile communities online, specifically the Outfest Legacy Collection, which is housed at UCLA, as well as Movie.com, which is an online cinephile community, and finally, AfterEllen.com, which is the case study that I'm going to be discussing today. So, I'd like to start my, my conversation about AfterEllen.com, which I imagine most of you are familiar with, and uh, which I'm very glad for the opportunity to have this as a, um, a, a workshop rather than a, a more conventional panel style presentation because I'm at the very beginning of what is for me a, not only a new project but a new methodological approach. I'm doing here a sort of uh, cultural or virtual ethnography and um, really looking into a kind of archival history of the internet that is something that I myself have not yet done. So I'm very curious to know your own experiences and recommendations for doing that kind of work. And yet, I'm also going to be tracing After Ellen's evolution as part of a longer historical trajectory and one that's very much old media related, and that has to do with the US history or genealogy of lesbian, bi, and queer women discussing with one another audiovisual media and digital media. So dating back to the first often named as such, uh, uh, such publication from the very late 40s, um, the uh, creation of someone who went by the name of Lisa Ben, uh, you can figure it out, lesbian, mm -hmm. and uh, who uh, was a secretary and who uh, created a newsletter, which as you can see was very bare bones, that circulated in a fairly uh, relatively limited community, but that did begin to do some of these early film reviews that talked about things that we're all very uh, accustomed to thinking about now in terms of representation and visibility. So I trace this genealogy through the latter, which is also a probably better known um, publication from the 50s, 60s, uh, into such publications from the 70s and 80s as Dyke Quarterly, and then uh, some of the more recent ones from the 90s on, including Anything That Moves, specifically uh, bisexual publications, so close to my own heart, uh, as well as Girlfriends and Curve, which is uh, still in publication and looking at specifically how these publications are invested in community building and resistance discourse around representation and visibility of queer people in film and television. So that brings me to After Ellen, which was launched in 2002 by Sarah Warren, who's a Wellesley alumna, as I am, am I, so another um, nice connection uh, to this project that I feel I have personally and who founded it as, uh, with the tagline that still exists to this day, uh, because visibility matters. And so there's always been this very, I think, foregrounded notion that visibility is important, and yet as identity politics and um, other discourses around queer theory and, um, and, uh, and other sorts of identity formations have evolved, there are, I think, uh, larger questions to be asked about this primary ethos of visibility mattering that After Ellen was started with. So that's one thing I'll be discussing. So the basic trajectory, and I'm going to just click on these links so that you can see the very different look of After Ellen as it's moved along through the years. Uh, in 2002, it looked roughly like this. And this is um, thanks to Julie Russo, my uh, co-associate, um, and the Wayback Machine, I'm able to 
Uh, if you don't know about this, it's a wonderful resource. I'm able to go back and look at what After Ellen looked like in 2002. If you're familiar with the way it looks today, and you'll see it in a moment, it's markedly different, uh, very lo-fi, but also already doing some of what I'm interested in documenting and analyzing in terms of thinking about representation, documenting political issues and actions, uh, profiling people in the community, and so forth. And then when in 2005, Warren, along with her partner, professional and personal partner, Lori Grant, founded Erosion Media LLC to launch AfterElton.com, which I bet you can figure out what the purpose of it was. Um, and Warren went on to uh, sell, I'm not sure that's going to link. All right, well, I'll skip that one. Oh, here it comes. OK, so that's just a quick look at what After Elton is doing differently from After Ellen. And then in 2006, there was, of course, the highly controversial sell sale to Logo and MTV, but owned by the parent media conglomerate Viacom of After Ellen and After Elton. And Warren was named an executive producer at Logo and went on to remain involved um, uh, in a fairly connected way, um, but less so than she had been earlier. And then in 2009, finally resigned from the, um, her affiliation with the company. And now Carmen Craiglow is the editor in chief of After Ellen, which today looks like this. So quite a bit different. And in fact, when I was linking to this, site, which is around 2006 at the time of the takeover, um, you actually see this logo uh, <laughs> uh, brand immediately hit you when you access the After Ellen archive through the Wayback Machine. So it's an interesting thing that it's not Viacom that is clearly labeling or, or um, uh, branded um, alongside After Ellen, but rather logo, which if you don't know is a gay and lesbian uh, cable channel. Um, so. I am starting the project of looking at the narrative that's been um, told about After Ellen by its users and fans of lesbian queer representation and uh, media um, as having changed significantly in the wake of the sale to Viacom. And what I'm interested in doing is actually tracking that to see if it in fact did happen in that kind of linear fashion, that kind of market of fashion, and uh, what that change looks like, what it consists of. So I'm starting from a theoretical perspective that incorporates Jackie Stacy's work on star fan relations and formations, along with Michael Warner's work on queer counterpublics in order to think about how after Ellen can be thought of as a site for resistance and for community building around the subject matter that it encompasses. Alongside Henry Jenkins' work on fan activism and participatory culture, and Suzanne Scott's work on affirmative versus transformative fandom to think about how the actual uh, usership and um, participation in After Ellen uh, is actually contoured. So in that realm, the methodology that I'm going to be using um, is aimed at examining how the independent, worn, owned, and run After Ellen era compares to the post-sale to Viacom up till the present era, and what that looks like in terms of first readership. So as best I can, trying to assess the number of hits at given points over its trajectory, the demographics of those users, and the kind of address to its users that After Ellen was making. Alongside authorship, who it was that was responsible for generating the content on the site, how much of that might have been user generated, how much was not, um, and how much kind of interactive participation was being encouraged or uh, allowed at any particular time the finance model, um, to what degree there was advertising, sponsorship, and donations being proffered on the site. And the design, certainly, which I think is uh, quite, as you've already noticed, no doubt, um, vividly uh, illustrated uh, as changing along 
uh, the trajectory of the history of After Ellen, and that includes branding, but also tags, graphics, layout, and links. But then finally, in the most substantive part of my analysis will have to do with the content itself. And so I'm interested in looking, of course, at the various genres of content, everything from columns, articles, recaps, forums, lists, uh, fan fiction, of which there is not very little, or very little fan sub titling blogs and vlogs. Of course, uh, they're very well known for those uh, in their latter history, as well as uh, analyzing kinds of coverage and bias questions uh, having to do with what films and what types of TV shows and where they derive from in terms of studio, production studios and channels. And also, of course, the historical and transnational scope, or lack thereof, of the content focused on in the site. Um, I'm also interested in thinking about the outing policy uh, and or the bias that the site may have for people who are out, lesbian, queer women, um, and what the diversity range and minority inclusion looks like on the site over time. Uh, the visibility rhetoric, what, uh, how that changes, and what uh, value is given to identity formations and identity politics, and positive representations in these various media. And then, of course, the big question of how greatly did Viacom-owned properties uh, benefit from the promotions allowed them after the sale. And you know, from a kind of user standpoint myself, and I've talked to other people about this, it seems like every time you go to AfterEllen.com, if you still do, that it's all about selling the real L word, right? Which is a logo show and a Viacom-owned product. But of course, I want to be a bit more rigorous in my analysis to indicate that that is the case. And then finally, I'm interested in looking at the tone and the address to readers to see if it is more in the, uh, the vein of affirmative, in that it's promotional or referential or aspirational about representations and about industry goings on uh, around queerness, or if it's more transformative in the sense of being critical, satirical, and political. And so then finally, I'd like to wrap up by looking at some of the more recent uh, and uh, very much influenced by After Ellen manifestations of these online queer and feminist communities. Um, Autostraddle.com is probably the one that I'll focus on the most because it's often offered up as the still independently owned um, uh, counterpoint to the too corporate now narrative of what After Ellen has become. But I'm also interested in looking at things like Cherry Girl and Velvet Park and also um, less queer focused but still feminist and still um, politically and, and visibility invested sites such as Feministing and Jezebel as well. So I welcome all of your comments in the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you.